Chapter 20 is entitled Economics in the Ozone Layer. By way of introduction, ozone is O3, so it's three oxygen atoms joined together in one molecule. More typically near the Earth's surface, oxygen atoms form O2, and so usually when you're studying chemistry you think of oxygen as being O2, not O3. There's a potential for confusion when we talk about ozone, which I want to address right away here in this next point. In the troposphere, which is the part of the atmosphere 0 to 15 kilometers from the Earth's surface, ozone is bad. In the stratosphere, which is 15 to 50 kilometers from the Earth's surface, ozone is good. So let me explain. In the troposphere near the Earth's surface, ozone is bad. Ozone is a pollutant. It's generated by, for example, automobile exhaust. Ozone tends to be bad on summer days, especially in the afternoon where there's a lot of sunlight. Ozone, however, can be bad in rather unusual spots. The most, perhaps the most unusual place where ozone pollution is bad is in eastern Utah near the Uinta Basin, so the town of Vernal, in the wintertime. Ozone is usually summer pollutant, so it's, scientists were really surprised that there were high levels of ozone in the Uinta Basin during the winter. It seems like the reason is because there's a whole lot of sunlight, because Vernal's at a very high altitude and there's a lot of snow cover. The snow intensifies the sunlight because the sunlight bounces over, off of the snow. Plus, there's a lot of oil and gas development in the Uinta Basin, and the uh, chemicals that, uh, that emanate from leaks in the pipes, you know, pipes have seams and those seams leak a little bit and the chemicals that are leaking from these seams seem to be interacting with the very intense wintertime sunlight to create an ozone problem. Now the reason why it's a problem, the reason why ozone is considered to be a pollutant at a low altitude is because it's highly chemically reactive and if you breathe it then the molecules that the ozone molecules want to chemically react with are going to be the molecules in your lung tissue and that's really not good for your lungs. There's an atmospheric scientist at the University of Utah who has described it as getting a sunburn inside your lungs if you breathe a lot of ozone. So ozone at ground level is a is a bad thing. The, that is not the topic of this chapter. The topic of this chapter is ozone in the stratosphere, where ozone is a good thing. What happens in the stratosphere is that the so-called ozone layer, the, it, it's not really a layer of pure ozone, but it's a high concentration of ozone in the stratosphere, is opaque to some ultraviolet light from the sun. So some wavelengths of ultraviolet light cannot penetrate the ozone layer and therefore they can't get to the Earth's surface. And it turns out that these ultraviolet light frequencies, if they were to be able to get to the Earth's surface, would have detrimental effects which I'll, which I'll be talking about over here. So the ozone forms a protective layer to protect the Earth's surface from this particular type of ultraviolet radiation. Now this other type of ultraviolet radiation that, that, that that does get through the ozone and that does uh, reach the Earth's surface and, and that we, we experience in our daily lives. So it, the ozone doesn't block all frequencies, but there's some frequencies of ultraviolet, ultraviolet light which the ozone blocks. And so we're, under natural circumstances, we don't see any at the Earth's surface. S next point. The main ozone destroying chemicals that humans emit are chlorofluorocarbons, which I'll call CFCs. And th that's the standard abbreviation. The book also uses that abbreviation. Chlorofluorocarbons break up in the upper atmosphere, releasing chloron ions. So the first part of the word chlorofluorocarbons is chloro, that's because they're made out of uh, chlorine atoms. And it turns out that these chloron ions serve as a catalyst of this chemical reaction. 
So in this reaction, on the left-hand side, you have two ozone molecules. So O3 is ozone, two ozone molecules. And on the right-hand side, you have three molecules of regular oxygen, O2. Now, I've written chlorine here like this. Chlorine is a catalyst of this reaction. We say it catalyzes the reaction. What that means is that it makes the reaction go much more quickly than it would otherwise go. But the chlorine ion doesn't participate in the reaction in the sense that it doesn't get used up. It's on either part of the left-hand side nor the right-hand side of the chemical equation. And so therefore, one chlorine ion can catalyze you know, potentially hundreds of these reactions. So it, without the chlorine ion present, it's really hard in the upper atmosphere for ozone to break down into regular oxygen. But with the chlorine ion present, the chlorine ion basically forms a, a helpful substrate that allows the ozone molecules to to physically configure themselves in a way that makes it possible for them to, to engage in this reaction and turn into oxygen. So the chlorine ions are the culprit in the ozone getting depleted and turning into regular oxygen. So what's the problem with diminishing ozone concentrations in the upper atmosphere? It's sometimes called a hole in the ozone layer. It's actually a, a thinning or reducing the concentration in, in the upper atmosphere. One of the reasons it's called a hole is because it turns out that these effects are particularly prominent over the North Pole and over the South Pole. The, so it looks, if you take a picture, let's say, from above the North Pole or above the South Pole of the ozone concentration, it looks a little bit like a donut. So that's where the name hole, hole comes from, because right over the poles, the concentration is the thinnest. The hole in the ozone layer causes human health effects. The biggest one is skin cancers, melanoma and carcinoma. And that's because when this frequency of ultraviolet light that we're not used to seeing hits human skin, it damages the DNA of human skin. Uh, a, a secondary effect is that it enhances the development of cataracts. Cataracts are a clouding of the lens of the eye. And once cataracts become very bad, uh, the person becomes blind unless they have cataract surgery, which was developed in the 20th century, which replaces the, the, the cataract, uh, replaces the, the lens with an artificial lens that's clear. There may also be immune system damage. This is more speculative. The book mentions it, so I thought I'd, I'd bring it up, but that's a more speculative effect of the increased ultraviolet radiation. The hole in the ozone layer also has ecosystem effects, and the most important one of which is damaging the DNA of plankton. And plankton form the base of the food pyramid in the ocean, so if you reduce the number of plankton, that has ramifications up the food chain. It reduces the number, let's say, of fish that people like to eat. So why use CFCs? CFCs are primarily used as refrigerants. And I wanted to explain a little bit about what a refrigerant is. A refrigerant is a chemical which can easily be turned into uh, a liquid or a gas. Basically, if it's a gas and you compress it a little bit, it'll turn into a liquid. And then if it's under pressure and then you release this pressure, then it turns into a gas. So here's a website I found of the refrigeration cycle. If you look on the left, you see a circle called evaporator. So think about your refrigerator or an air conditioner in a home. The refrigerator has evaporator coils. What happens in these coils is that what goes into the coils, the input is a low pressure uh, uh, liquid. Um, 
Now, the fact that it's low pressure, I guess, is not particularly important. What's more important is that it's, it's a liquid. Um, and it's actually higher pressure than what's on the bottom. So the low pressure and high pressure in this diagram is, I think, a little, a little confusing. In any case, the liquid passes through these coils and gets actually put under lower pressure as it passes through the coils, and the liquid then turns into a gas. The, you, the kind of chemical that you have to have in this loop has to have the following property, that when it turns from a liquid to a gas, it absorbs heat. And so as this chemical is turning from a liquid to a gas in the refrigerator coil, it's absorbing heat from its surroundings, and its surroundings are the inside of the refrigerator or the air that's passing through uh, heating and air conditioning duct in your home. So the heat goes into the fluid and away from the kind of stuff that you want to get cooler. But this needs to turn into, this needs to be, this needs to occur in a cycle. So what leaves the refrigerator is a gas. In order to make it go into a cycle, it has to go here uh, at the bottom to a compressor. And the compressor uh, squeezes the gas. In squeezing the gas, it uh, turns the gas back into a liquid. And that releases heat. So a refrigerator makes the inside of the refrigerator cooler, but it makes the room in which the refrigerator is located warmer. Air conditioners, standard residential air conditioners, are called split system air conditioners. They make the, the air in the heating and air conditioning duct cooler, but then they have an outside unit that makes the outer doors warmer. So what happens in a in a residential air conditioning system is that the, this fluid is transported in a pipe out of doors, it goes into the compressor, uh, it makes the outside air hotter, and it, therefore it loses heat and becomes a liquid and then goes back into the, the indoors. So the diagram that I'm showing here is more complicated than the story that I'm describing. Um, I'm really not talking about the expansion valve, and I'm kind of combining the compressor and the condenser. But I just wanted to give you a brief idea of what the refrigeration cycle is. And so one has to have a particular kind of chemical that's going to have the properties that will make this thing work, that will make this refrigeration cycle work, and CFCs turn out to have exactly those properties. And so that's why they're, uh, they're so useful for, refri for refrigeration. So re uh, CFCs are primarily used as refrigerants, but they have had other more minor uses. Uh, one is as a propellant. Think about a spray can. You have some desirable liquid that's in the spray can. It's, it, yeah, it's usually a liquid. Um, but in order to get it to spray, it has to be under pressure, and typically you need to have some kind of gas mixed in with the liquid. And so when you press the valve, the pressure gets released, and the gas escapes from the valve, carrying the desirable liquid with it. CFCs used to be used in those, those kind of aerosol spray cans. They were also used as uh, cleaning agents as foam blowing agents. So if you think about styrofoam, look carefully at styrofoam. Styrofoam looks like it's made up of little cells. Each one of those cells came from a pellet. The pellet sort of looks and feels like a plastic pellet, has to be in some sense exploded or expanded in order to make a softer foam. And so you need some kind of gas to do that expansion, and CFCs used to be used to do that. Uh, finally, they were used in fire suppression. There are some places where you don't want to use w water to fight a fire. Uh, a, a classic example is a grease fire in a kitchen, but CFCs weren't used in households to stop those kind of fires. There are other kind of chemicals uh, 
some, like uh, fire suppressing powders that you can get in a residential fire extinguisher that he used for that. But imagine trying to suppress a fire in a library. It, that's a much wider area than a grease fire in a kitchen pan, so powder isn't going to work very well. But you really don't want to use water in a library because water is going to ruin all the books. So CFCs are used in fire suppression systems. I, I write finally another class of ozone destroying chemicals or halons which are also used in fire suppression systems, uh, particularly in uh, libraries and especially in archive divisions of libraries where you have one-of-a-kind materials. So this is a problem that CFCs were really useful but they caused the hole in the ozone layer. So, in 1989, an international agreement called the Montreal Protocol was signed. And this is an agreement to eventually phase out the use of CFCs. I write, developing countries were treated differently than developed countries, but it's not as differently as in the Kyoto Protocol eight years later. Basically, developing countries were going to have to decrease CFCs in the same way that developed countries were going to have to do it but they had more years to do it. So while the U.S. had to decrease by a certain extent in five years, Mexico maybe got eight or nine years, just as an example. Now I want to point out that CFCs are a whole class of chemicals. And the Montreal Protocol didn't ban the whole class of chemicals. It, what it has done is to give incentives to the chemical industry to come up with new members of that class that work pretty well in refrigeration, not as well as the original CFCs, but still pretty well, but were much less likely to hurt the ozone layer. And so nowadays, if you have an air conditioning system in a residential home, it's going to use some kind of CFC, but the type of CFC is going to be very different than the type of CFCs that were used before the Montreal Protocol. It's going to be much less damaging to the ozone layer. Also, there are extremely strict laws now that prohibit heating and air conditioning technicians from, let's say, just cutting open a copper pipe and letting the CFC evaporate. Now, all of the CFCs have to be captured by the technician who's working on the system. They can't just be released into the atmosphere. I say here at the end that the Montreal Protocol is generally considered a success. Let me show you some examples of that. Here's the Wikipedia page on the Montreal Protocol. And here are the 25th anniversary celebrations. I just wanted to read the last paragraph before the notes. Within 25 years of signing, parties to the Montreal Protocol celebrate significant milestones. Significantly, the world has phased out 98% of the ozone-depleting substances contained in nearly 100 hazardous chemicals worldwide. Every country is in compliance with stringent obligations. And every country, that doesn't mean every country that's a signatory. Every single country in the entire world has been a signatory. In fact, I guess that's what it says later on in the sentence. Let me continue reading. And the Montreal Protocol has achieved the status of the first global regime with universal ratification. Even the newest member state, South Sudan, ratified it in 2013. The UN Environmental Program received accolades for achieving global consensus that, quote, demonstrates the world's commitment to ozone protection and, more broadly, to global environmental protection. Finally, here's a graph showing, uh, as it says at the top, the stratospheric ozone concentration in the southern hemisphere. And you can see that it was falling in the early 1980s. The rate of fall started to decrease after the signing of the Montreal Protocol. You didn't, it didn't seem to be getting much worse or much better between roughly 1995 and 2005, but after 2005, the ozone concentration started to recover. And it's continued that this is, so this is data through 2017. Most scientific observers are quite optimistic that in a few decades, the ozone concentration is going to go up to where it was before it began to be damaged by human activity. And so, as I said uh, on the, the earlier slide, the Montreal Protocol 
does seem to be a successful environmental international agreement. Well, one could ask, if the Montreal Protocol was so successful, why has it been? Why was the Kyoto Protocol not successful? Why has it been so much harder to deal with climate change than to deal with the hole in the ozone layer? And presumably that's because it was rather easy to find substitutes for the type of CFCs that were causing a lot of damage to the ozone layer. Yes, they are more expensive than the old kind of CFCs and they don't work quite as well in terms of refrigeration, but they're not that much more expensive and they work fairly well. Whereas it's much, it's been much harder to find good substitutes for fossil fuels.